so as, a, as a way of renouncing and denouncing uh, what they had been doing. And it tells us that the pile of books, I mean, it was a bonfire. There, there were 50,000 uh, drachmas or, or days' wages. I calculated that if, if somebody works uh, kind of for, for, for 200 years, they would then have enough money to buy the number of books that were burnt. That's how much it was worth in, in that day. 200 years worth of work. Um, and, and yet, as Paul writes to the Ephesian church, we see again and again later in the letter that he's telling them, guys, you've got to take this Christianity seriously. We see him praying here in this text and saying, I'm praying. I'm praying for you. I've seen evidence that you've unwrapped the gift. But I'm praying for you that you will begin to appropriate and use that gift, that it won't remain a key taped to the inside cover of a Bible for the rest of your life. But it'll be something that impacts your life and helps you to grow in your Christianity. So let's look at how, what, he, what he prays for, because I think that these are, are some, um, some very important things that we need to note. What is it that, that Paul prays for that will help these Christians to grow, to have the present appropriated in their lives so that they can live out their Christian faith in a way that will glorify God and change them and impact society, that will keep them keeping on in the faith. Well, he tells us as we look at the text, um, in verse 17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. God wants these people, he inspires the, the, the Apostle Paul, he wants these people to know him better. It's an interesting thing as we go through, you'll see there in verse 17, we've got uh, the word know, uh, you know him better. And then in verse 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. These two words for know are different words. They've come forward in English in the translations as the word know, but in the original language, these are different words. And, and I think Paul is trying to highlight something here. The first one that we see in verse 17 where he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. The, the first word there is, is kind of the knowledge of intimate relationship. That it, it, it's not just a case of, well, you know, I know about God, if you give me a quiz, I can, I can get all the answers right. I can tell you who God is. I can unpack all the depths of the Trinity for you. This is not that kind of knowledge. This is the kind of intimate knowledge where, where people are in a personal relationship with this living God. And, and Paul says, I'm praying that God is going to... to unlock your heart. He's going to open your eyes. He's going to let you see and know this God in this intimate way. And that's God's plan for each one of us. If, if we are to be people who unwrap the gift and grow, we need to be a people who know God intimately and personally. It's not just a case of coming to church Sunday after Sunday. We need to know God. And he's given us the ability to know him through Jesus Christ. And, and, and he prays, prays for us that we would know him. Secondly, the second idea of knowledge is not just that we know God personally, but that we, we know 
And he tells us three things. The first one's at the bottom of the page there, the hope to which he has called you. And then on the next slide, we'll see, uh, he wants to know the hope to which he has called you. The second thing, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the, sa uh, in the saints. And the third, his incomparably great power for us who believe. And so let's look at those three things that he wants us to know. That he wants us to know. Many of you will be aware that in Zimbabwe today, uh, well, yesterday, we had elections. Many of you will know that in Zimbabwe, the national situation is, for people who don't live there, it's mind-blowing. If I tell you that a loaf of bread when I left Zimbabwe last Sunday cost $10 million, you'll scratch your head and say, I don't understand that. Okay, that's Zimbabwean dollars, not American dollars, but 10 million Zimbabwe dollars. That's what a loaf of bread cost last Sunday. I heard on CNN yesterday that a loaf of bread in Zimbabwe now costs 25 million dollars. I've only been away a week. And the price has gone from, from 10 million to 25 million. Let me tell you, that's very depressing. And, and, and when, if, if you live in a context like that, there's a sense of hopelessness that, that just squashes you. It strangles you. It, it, it enslaves you. But the question is, the question is, how do we get beyond that hopelessness? And I know, I know from, from the time that I lived in this country that for many people in life, there is a sense of hopelessness. We live in a busted, broken world. And so as I talk about the Zimbabwean context and say, well, we sense hopelessness there, I know that, 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 that that's a reality of the human condition. We sense it everywhere. And Paul raises the real problem of hopelessness in the letter to Ephesians. In chapter 2, verse 12, he tells them this. Speaking of them before they were Christians, before they were believers, he said in chapter 2, verse 12, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. They were miserable. They were hopeless. They had nothing going for them. And God wants each one of us to remember this morning that we have a lot going for us. For though we were once sinners, dead in our transgressions, as chapter 2 verse 1 tells us, we have been made alive in Christ. That is what has happened to us after Easter. We have a hope that is steadfast, that is certain. It will not be taken away. And it's a wonderful hope. And when people ask me, how is it that I can keep going on in Zimbabwe? How is it that Zimbabweans can keep going on? It's because we are having to learn that to cope with our context, we have to look beyond it. And we have to see the hope of Jesus Christ. Um, I, I don't know if you noticed, and I, I don't have it with me, the, the, um, the notice sheets that we have have right at the, at the beginning um, something from, uh, let me grab mine here. It's, I've got, um, If we look at the reflect on the message section, which was taken from Eugene, Eugene Peterson's uh, statement uh, or translation, interpretation of, of the, the text that we're looking at today, um, he, he speaks of, of God and God's purpose. And he says that God is in charge of all, uh, it has in charge of it all, um, or he is in charge of it all. He has the final word on everything at the center of all this. Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not 
peripheral to the world, the world is peripheral to the church. And that's an important thing for us to understand. God is at work in the world today. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10, 